Conrad Steiner, Doctor of Medicine. Tonight's story is the second and concluding part of our case history titled, The Reach of a Giant. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight is in the field of orthopedics, the science of the human bone structure. The object in point, an aluminum template or pattern. The case in point, James Elwood Martin. Five years ago, Jim fractured two vertebrae in a fall. Shortly afterwards, he developed symptoms of an especially crippling form of spinal arthritis. In succeeding years, his spine began to ossify, to turn into solid bone. And what was worse, it slowly forced his upper body forward and downward. The year before that tragic fall, Jim Martin had married the girl with whom he had been in love since high school days. And through the painful three years that followed the accident, Jim had the love and support of his wife, Edith. But as the disease progressed and the deformity became worse, Jim insisted that his wife leave him and find a new life of her own. Although she protested strongly, Jim had his way, and the sobbing Edith left the man she loved. Rheumatoid spondylitis, the particular form of spinal arthritis with which Jim was afflicted, is above all a lonely disease. Medicine knows no cure, no positive remedy. The battle against it is the battle of a man's will against his body. My sister Ruth and her husband Roy have had this offer in Chicago. Jim, they want me to go too. Mm -hmm. Jim. Jim, if I'm that far away from you... I don't know. Jim, I've got to see you. I've got to talk to you. Oh, please say yes. Look, you don't have to make up your mind about going to Chicago with Roy and Ruth yet. Not now. What? <laughs> oh, no, Edie, please. <laughs> Look, I, I promised I promised you I'd beat this thing, and it's one promise I'm going to keep. Well, that's better. Hurry, Jim. Hurry. Okay, honey. Take care of this, All right. All right, goodbye. Jim's tragic condition had started five years before with a fall. It took another fall to begin his perilous journey back to happiness. Jim Martin was not to make the journey alone. A few weeks after he fell and after a careful examination in the hospital, Jim's personal physician referred him to two doctors, both orthopedic surgeons, Dr. David Milton and his associate, Dr. Tim Lawrence. Jim's future was in their hands. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. I've never seen anything like it. Who is it? Doctor Herder's referral. I think he was with Sanford before that. Martin, uh, Jim Martin. Well, is he showing up? Yeah, tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Hmm. Let's take another look at it. Okay, go ahead. Jim Martin's second fall caused another fracture in his spine, in the 12th dorsal vertebra. The weight of the spine bearing down on the fracture caused it to disintegrate slowly until the vertebra collapsed. The forward curvature of Jim's deformity increased 20 degrees. He was in a state of dangerous exhaustion, and finally his will could fight no longer. Well, I suppose there's nothing I can tell you about your spinal arthritis, Mr. Martin. You probably know as much about it as anyone. I know it's worse, Dr. Lawrence. I may as well tell you right from the beginning that there's nothing, there's no way we can restore any degree of flexibility to your spine. I know that. Is uh, Mrs. Martin outside? Hmm? 
If she is, I think she should be in on this. <clears throat> so, my wife left me years ago. It is I asked her to. She isn't there. Well, there are some things we can do, Mr. Martin. Two things, in fact. First, I can put you in a cast, which will completely immobilize your torso and uh, eventually would relieve some of the pain. What's the other? A few years ago, a doctor in Boston performed and described an operation that we call spinal osteotomy. It's not a cure-all wouldn't even affect the arthritis. But it has achieved an excellent correction of the deformity, would take the strain off your back, and would restore you to an erect position permanently. You mean you could straighten me? I wouldn't be bent over like this? If we were successful, yes. But you got to know the truth, there are a number of dangers involved. All right. Go on. We'd be working among the nerve roots of your spine. Any injury to those nerve roots could partially paralyze you. You could end up a paraplegic. You've been bent over a number of years, Mr. Martin. There's no telling what might happen to your internal organs and your circulation if your body was suddenly straightened. And there's always the danger of uh, extreme shock due to the rupture of a blood vessel. You trying to tell me I might die, Dr. Lawrence? Is that it? Yes. That possibility always exists at surgery. Dr. Lawrence, I want to tell you I can't go on this way. I'm not being dramatic, I just mean what I say. I can't continue like this. If there's any kind of chance. There is. In the name of all that's holy, let's take it. There's one more thing I must tell you. I have never performed this operation. Very few doctors have. Can you? I've done a number of operations on the spine. This wouldn't be too different. Let me tell you something, Dr. Martz. In all these years, the only thing anyone's ever been able to do for me is give me pep talks, pity me. Well, I'm sick and tired of it. I sent my wife away because I couldn't stand to be pitied. I want people to level with me. Okay, you've leveled with me. I want this operation more than anything I've ever wanted in my life. Do you understand me? I want it. All right. We'll get in touch with you as soon as surgical arrangements have been made. All right, Mr. Martin. Brave man. Yeah. Tim, you still here? Just going over everything once more. You look bushed. You've looked tired for days. Feel all right. Look, Tim, you've read every scrap you could find about spinal osteotomy. There's much to read, isn't there? You've gone over it and over it, pushing yourself as though the whole problem had hypnotized you. Has, in a way. I mean, you go on. At least I do. In a rut, same thing over and over again. And boredom sets in. And when something like this osteotomy comes along, you 
You come alive again. There's a, there's a challenge to be met. A re real challenge. Wish I was more like you, David. <laughs> no, you're not, thank heaven. You're a brilliant doctor. But you need some rest, that all. Oh, yes, I need some rest. Every time I... I'm sorry. Go ahead, yell if it makes you feel better. I don't get any rest even when I'm asleep. I keep going over this operation, every second of it, over and over. It's like a recurrent nightmare. I don't know. I just don't know. Are you scared of this thing, Tim? No. No, of course not. Remember what happened after the Dykstra case? Remember what old Burley said? Yes, he said you didn't have a nerve in your body when you operate. Yeah. And it impressed a lot of people, too. That's funny. That's very funny. I know what's the matter with you. You're like Martin. He's sick with one disease, and you're sick with another. Yeah, what? Genius. Shit. <laughs> I suppose with some people, this kind of gift is a blessing. With you, it's as much a curse as it is anything else. It drives you and uses you until the problem is licked. Then, when it's licked, it tosses you aside. But to you, it's a way of life. And no matter what anybody said, you couldn't change. Not even if you wanted to. You're a slave to your own brilliance. I admire you. I'm even a little awed by you. And I pity you, too, Tim. Perhaps the most important single preparation for the operation followed several days later. The latest x-rays of Jim Martin's spine were projected upon thick white paper and a meticulously exact tracing was made. The tracing completed, the angle of the bone wedge to be removed had to be determined. To avoid any danger of bony impingements upon the spinal cord itself, it was decided to perform the operation on the lower spine, between the second and third lumbar vertebra. A line was drawn on the tracing at this point. Dr. Lawrence cut the tracing along this line, severing the tracing at the point of the projected operation. Next, two halves of the tracing were slowly and carefully rotated. In essence, this caused the trace drawing of the curved spine to become straightened. When the maximum safe correction was attained, another line was drawn. An angle now evident, consisting of a line angling from the posterior surface of the spine forward to the dura mater, or nerve covering, at a sharp angle. The angle measured 60 degrees. Therefore, if a wedge of bone measuring 60 degrees was to be removed from between the patient's second and third lumbar vertebra, and the upper and lower arms of the spine forced posteriorly until the cut edges of the spine met and closed, the spine would straighten out to the degree calculated here. Improvisation. In this case, a pattern was needed. An aluminum template was cut to a specific size and an angle of 60 degrees was to be used to check the accuracy of the bone removal during the course of the actual operation. After determining the exact area for the osteotomy, the template is placed indicating the bone to be removed. I started a little while ago. I had a chance to clean up the place. Come in. Looking well, Jim. Sit down. Sit down. I'm sorry to drop in so suddenly. It's about Roy. Oh? Hmm? Decided about Chicago, huh? He's going. 
leaving in about five or six weeks. You going with him? I don't know. It's what I had to see you about. Don't you want to go? But you're not your wife. I want to come home. Edie, this thing isn't getting any better. It's, it's worse. Worse than it was two years ago. Jim, you need somebody now more than ever. Maybe you need some. Maybe in Chicago you, you know, a sudden break. Jim. Why do you think I asked you to leave me? I want you to have a life with someone that you don't have to be ashamed of. I'm not ashamed of you. Suppose something happened to me, then where would you be? What could happen? Like I died. Well, it could happen. And over like this, I'd see a car. It could happen. You mean you want me to go to Chicago with Ruth and her husband? Might as well say goodbye to our marriage. Jim, do you really want me to go? Look, Edie, I'm going to beat this thing. I swear I am. All I need is just a little more time. Roy's leaving in a month. All right, a month then. Make it a month. Let's give ourselves just, just this much longer. But why now? Why all of a sudden a month? Jim, what's happened? What are you going to do? Edie, will you believe in me just a little longer? Trust me. I've got to do this thing myself. Jim, if only... Oh, darling. Edie, you better go now. You better go on back to your sister. All right, Jim. All right. At 7.30 on the morning of March 1st, 1948, James Martin entered surgery. How do you feel, Jim? Floating. Positioning of the patient upon the table for a spinal osteotomy is of supreme importance. Since the forward curvature of Martin's spine was so severe he could not lie on his stomach, he was placed on his right side. The incision is made. The skin, fascia, and muscles are stripped from the spine for a distance of about six inches. The bony spine is laid bare. At this point, the complete ankylosis of the spinal column is demonstrated. There is no posterior segmental separation. Transfusions of whole blood were administered as the surgery continued. In addition, other drugs were administered intravenously to ensure the patient's withstanding the shock of surgery. Once the bone is exposed, the actual osteotomy begins. Using an osteotome, a bone chisel, and a mallet, the infinitely painstaking chipping away of the fused bone from the nerve roots. The nerve roots are completely surrounded and trapped in the abnormally formed bone. One slip of the chisel might mean permanent division of the nerve itself. Dr. Frank's familiarity with the position of the nerve roots is of great importance at this stage of the operation. The amount of bone to be removed has previously been determined. That amount, and only that amount, must be excised. If a lesser amount is chipped away, correction will be incomplete and the patient will remain bent forward. If too much is taken out, overcorrection will result and the patient may be bent over backwards, his eyes permanently fixed on the sky. Periodically, the template is inserted into the incision and the amount of bone thus far removed gauged and measured. For two and one half hours, centimeter by centimeter, the cavity was shaped, a 60 degree wedge driving down to the dura mater, which covers the nerve roots in the lumbar region. When the dura was exposed, the wedge was extended on each side of it into the intervertebral foramina, through each of which runs a major spinal nerve root, supplying sensation and motor power to the lower extremities. Finally, the exact amount of bone had been removed. The aluminum pattern exactly fitted the cavity of the patient's spinal column. One half of the diameter of the spine had been removed. Still intact was the anterior or forward portion of the spinal column made up of the vertebral bodies and two ligaments, one lying directly in back of the vertebra and in front of the spinal cord, the other lying in front of the vertebral bodies. 
Forcefully bending the spine backward tears the anterior or forward ligament. Additional force then tears the vertebral bodies apart. This action will close the wedge-shaped defect in the back part of the bony spine. With the rupture of these ligaments, paralysis of the intestines takes place. The final straightening of the spine must be done by force, skillfully applied. Agonizing slowness, the long frozen spine gave way. Ligaments stretched, ruptured, gave way. Cramped organs moved into a suddenly altered abdominal cavity. Slowly the cavity which had been chiseled into the spine disappeared. The edges of bone came together. And there on the operating table, Jim Martin took on the appearance at last of an erect man. The danger did not end on the table. Since all victims of rheumatoid spondylitis are diaphragmatic breathers, the distension of the intestines might cause some extreme pressure upon the diaphragm and result in suffocation of the patient. To avoid this possibility, a gastric suction machine is kept in operation. The patient was fed intravenously during the first two days following the surgery. There was still danger of a blood clot. Boy, I never thought it'd be this good again. Such a... Such a little thing could mean so much. Just to lie here, on my back, straight up. Better keep an eye on me, Doc. I'm liable to float right off the bed. Now, you may not feel like it, but you're gonna stay right where you are for another six or seven weeks. Yeah, but on my back. Be the greatest six weeks of my life. Sure. Back, been giving you much pain? Look, what little pain I got, I want to keep a while. So don't you go trying to take it away from me. Reminds me how things used to be. March 19th, 1948. While his doctor, his friend, looked on, with the assistance of a hospital attendant, Jim Martin stood erect by the side of his bed. And for the first time in many years, he could look the world straight in the eye. busy right now, but you'll see him. You'll be coming into the office for the next six months. Yeah. How long do I have to be in the street jacket? Oh, about five months. Until the fusion of the osteotomy site takes place again. Oh, good. Caught you in time. I was afraid you might have gone. No, I... Yes, this is the time for the thank you speech, isn't it? Don't, don't try to say anything. I want you to know that in more ways than you'll ever understand, I'm the one who's grateful. your physician, Dr. Herbert. He's got somebody to take care of you at home. Thanks. Drive you home, Jim. And so it was that on a May morning, the final gun of the battle sounded. The personal struggle of one man against his rebellious body was won. Happiness can make a man feel like a giant. Nothing, not even the sky, is too high for his reach, and no horizon bounds him in. After five pain-wrecked and frightening years, Jim Martin was a happy man again.